Hello everyone, today we talk about archery in the medieval western art of war. You know that I dedicated myself often to medieval infantry, not just on Schwerpunkt, but uh, in part as my um, professional specialization. And that I'm always glad to discuss the role that infantry and missile warfare, which may not even be uh, overlapping, as you know, today we'll talk also about horse archery for that matter, uh, had in the in fact in the synergy required to be you know effective on, on the battlefield. As we've seen, there is essentially never a mono arm military system that manages to prevail over a combined arms one, right? In the Middle Ages you have that happy um, phase for for foot soldiers in the first half of the 14th century that leads to some clamorous victories even against what would remain fundamentally the the size of um, armor, at least the, the upper one, right, until the, uh, the, the mid 15th century, as a matter of fact, um, that is heavy cavalry, like the very elite, right, uh, and that very too often has been uh, painted also in a broader cultural sense. Oh my God! You know, from from the later Middle Ages, cavalry was over; it had no future, and sort of you know, in those centuries, it sort of not didn't do nothing. But it say it was destined to fall, and was not the size of any more. The the people were rising. This kind of stuff, um, and um, I will not discuss today the usual issue of separating in the, art, in the history of the art of war what happens in the first half of the 14th century with what happens starting from the 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 second half of the 15th which is a very different um, thing including properly the introduction of um, say multiple arms with uh, at the size of foot one uh, but in fact not the uh, standing alone of, of the of the same right just as a decisive system even the Swiss that vir had virtually no other arm at their disposal um, would in fact be an exception and in fact last just a few and in, in a particular context so always remember that um, like Counting the, I don't know, even the Flemish at Courtrai had some crossbowmen here and there, but that doesn't count like a functional arm organized on the battlefield for an effective combined uh, force, right? And there is a general, um, say, enthusiasm in, I would say, the West in general. This has been adopted actually by the rest of the world to some extent. That uh, is the monofactorial explanation. Uh, bound to, to technology, right? The idea that when you look at this late medieval warfare, at the end of the day, what really changed is that there were new weapons that defeated cavalry, right? The reason why cavalry as an arm was defeated is not a, a broader political or social issue. It's that some guy out of the blue invented a weapon that magically cut down cavalry and, you know, everything followed, like nobody really knows according to, to this sort of fantasy. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that's uh, a favorite explanation. And most of this, of course, derived from... Actually, a, a military system I have an enormous admiration for, but that gets constantly misrepresented. That is, obviously, the English uh, army of the Hundred Years' War, um, which, by this point, like in historiography, but I don't think, actually, there's ever even been properly a moment in history in which anybody thought that the longbow made the thing, all right? Uh, nor alone, nor, nor prevalently uh, in the equation. Of course, it was about the men-at-arms, it was about, in fact, this heavy either mounted, or in this case, more prevalently, as you know, this mounted men-at-arms, that heavy, uh, heavy element that uh, managed to stop, like, any in any other army, like, the or it had the, the function in that case, because they, they would lose also at some point um, the, the other heavy element that could be, in fact, mounted or dismounted and so there actually there is a, a pretty sound symmetry when you look at the hundred years war we will surely observe this a bit more in depth i am sort of proud uh, it doesn't happen to to frequent like a, a video that i make that i really like uh that was instead fortunately the one about the battle of poitiers that sort of shows uh pretty well 1356 the masterpiece of the black prince this um how the art of war is not really about one type of um, weapon or another, but not even uh, 
a, a specific type of military model rather than another, right? Um, the fact that we associate, for example, the death of cavalry or at least the say knightly bloodshed uh, suffered, right, by by knights uh, for battles like, uh, in fact, Poitiers, as in Cour, um see, but also other, mm, say, military contexts, like the one, for example, the Mongol invasion of Europe, or the later uh, crusading uh, the defeats at the battles of um, Nicopolis and, and Varna, has sort of brought a many, let's be unspecific about this, um, which is, of course, not specific. Of course, in, in the academia, this has been asserted, has been clarified, has been, you know, now established. There is, it's not, as I said before, it's never even actually been an issue, but the pop culture is another story. And so the idea that all this has to do, oh my god, they were using bows, right? This is something that the knight was not doing, because the knight, first and foremost, um, thought that it was so cool that he would uh, downplay the the role of any other weapon, like of, of people fighting on foot, um, of uh, any other system that was not its own, right? And so this this notion that I don't know the French knights were just a bunch of imbeciles that went impaling themselves on um, English um, longbow arrows or you know pointy um, uh, stakes uh, fixed on the ground um, would be um, you know the the same you know the, the always the, the same punishment for arrogance and sort of blindness um, culturally socially etc which is a narrative that of course um, doesn't doesn't match with the, the military historical reality um, it's obviously a very heavily uh, ideological one like mostly emphasizing the role of the middle man like of the of the of the commoner uh in all this and pretending that at any point um let's say the the commoner had this decisiveness over the um the 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 mounted arm right and that this was essentially even a political or moral primate of, of any sort and this is easy to overlap to misunderstand because first of all when you look at for example the english armies of the hundred years war you um you appreciate we're talking the middle ages in general but as we will see this applies also to great part of the ancien regime really when infantry was indeed uh, the size of that point um that you talk about footmen but to again in the as we just said in the broader economy, you don't realize that those who actually stopped the enemy armies were the men at arms, so the actual nobility, not the commoners, right? Uh, let's not even discuss, of course, the fact that if these guys had not been there, the longbowmen would have been totally slaughtered, as any other missile element that, in fact, would never fight without in, in an auxiliary role with um, with together with a next to 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 a heavy arm, right? Uh, and there is again no exception in history. It's never in history, like uh, before, like the the eighteenth century, like just like when musketry um, arrives to that level of you know capacity of, that is always a compact mass, a, a drill like a concerted one with with other arms um, that manages to um, to to win anywhere right uh, the bow does not do it there are not armies that win because they have bows right um that's never the size of arm and it was never it had never meant to be by anyone right nobody at the time would have thought that i don't know you would stop french cavalry charges with long bows right because they didn't and there is n nowhere in the source like anything that suggests uh in any battle that every anybody at the time ever even remotely thought something like that nor that let alone that this could have ever happened uh, in the first place, right? Taking down one horse or 10 uh, or 100 um, in the broader account of, I don't know, taking down 2,000, right, uh, is completely normal and it's not decisive and the rest is done by qual qualitatively and much more potently somebody else, right? Um, but this overlaps also with the Renaissance, right, and the idea that Essentially, it was individual freedom that brought to that of 
uh, the knightly elite, which is actually false, because if anything, what happened during the Renaissance was that the knightly elite, let's say what had been the knightly elite, the nobility, at this point controlled so much, right, the rest of society, that they could themselves also arm uh, commoners in large, in unprecedentedly large numbers in, in the medieval art of war, which was transforming, in fact, itself in, in the modern one, um, and making them dependent on them, right? And this, the art of war was, of course, developing together always with cavalry that was always there, doesn't matter how shrinking, right? Especially at the peak like of, of this during the, the mid-16th century, but also artillery, meaningfully enough. Um, and so all the assets and resources that could have not been possible without the ancien regime, without the modern state, it was run by it, and with the commoners actually that had long gone, especially during the late Middle Ages and the mid-14th century crisis, any political decisiveness, right? Um, so people like to mix up cards, right? Confusing the um, uh, bourgeois and the, the, the rustics of the early 14th century with the professional soldiers of, recruited by the, the the princes, right, from the commoners of the of the Renaissance, right, and making the equation, but it's still infantry voting, saying, but no, they didn't, right, it was a completely different system, and to explain this by saying, you know, infantry was acquiring importance and attaching all these sort of rebellistic attitude to it is a, is a gross misunderstanding, uh, not just of Western history, but properly of the entire um, art of war, right, in, in a, in a, the, in ways that, of course, they intertwine one another. And today, we, we can know that these two elements are very dear to me because uh, not just they are just what is normally told, um, in spite of the weird attempts of the so-called you know military revolutionists that have been probably one of the, the most painful symptoms of cultural illiteracy that, unfortunately, in the last generations, among the many others we've had in the, in the West. Um, but there is also, and properly, like a, a history of the art of war that is interesting to sort of start observing. Today, we, we will look at, of course, in a very sketchy way, to the half millennium from the 11th to the 16th century. Uh, and the role of some reference also to the early Middle Ages, of course, of archery, broadly meant, so not just the archers, as you know, also the, the crossbowman is an archer, the bowman, let's say, um, and um, let's say how, you know, what real role this played and what overall, like in the balance, also civilizational clash, for example, during the Crusades or the Mongol invasion and the Ottoman wars, etc., this arm really had, right? We have seen already, again, in, in other videos, the aforementioned issues, we talked a lot about pike and shot, we talked a lot about, and we'll keep doing that, by the way, about, again, medieval infantry and archery and the survival, even in the early modern, in early modern warfare, things like the composite bow, the long bow, the crossbow. Um, today, we just look quite simply, but looking at sort of the essentials, right? This, the, the role of of the bowmen uh, between the 11th and the 15th century in the West, right? Um, and you know that we cover a bit in other bit is what was happening in the rest of the world, so that gradually we will consolidate well what a bit was happening in the rest. But we already observed how, for example, the bow was a much more important weapon in the East, right? For many reasons that are at this point like too long to resume. But let's put it in this way: like, it 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 had to do in part with that individual liberty. Like, if you want to boast, like, the sense of, you know, Western, surely civic and sort of individual um, liberal in the classical sense um, of of the word, politologically, um, identity, you can say that even when the majority of us was really just a bunch of commoners capable of fighting on foot and subordinated to the feudal elite, like, we were tougher individually and collectively than guys rode the step with composite bows, right? And uh, subjects of millinery empires in China or in India that, however, had a more broken peasantry, right? That had, that sense, less individual quality, 
right? So that is the one you should look at, not making some strange revival of, you know, political capacities that never occurred, right, in in, uh, in Europe up to just like a, a, a few centuries ago, right? While the late Middle Ages, the early modern age, like being something very, very different, right? And this is exemplified in many ways by the fact that in the West, the bow had and would remain essentially a hunting weapon, right? Uh, this is notorious even for who has the distinguished pleasure, passion, hobby, like, like I do, of visiting uh, European armories and finding, of course, like the, the military weapon proper, the, the, just a distinction, especially in the early uh, modern age of the, the more hunting weapon that continues, right, being used, uh, in fact, next also there for a longer time uh, to uh, firearms um, technology, right? And the weapon was not just uh, like overall, like a, a hunting weapon, but properly a poor hunt, poor hunting weapon. Um, in other words, like the average uh, peasant in early medieval times in Europe, used the bow and this notoriously is it's not just a european thing by the way it could be transposed even for the step guy for the again for the for the egyptian for for other people that really as a basic weapon would have the pretty lame bow i mean i don't know how to stress this enough you know going armed with a like as these guys would be eventually, as we'll see now, led it as, as such because they had they were so poor that very often had out only with this weapon, equated to the fact that they were militarily inferior to literally anybody else because you had just literally like um, a missile weapon, right? And this thing does not end when I don't know the the archers become professional or the crossbowmen become professional. They were useful. They were good, they killed a lot of people, they were effective, but they weren't decisive, and they kept not being decisive. What was the other day when we were talking about the indenture um, of the of that um, Anglo-Britonic um, uh, lord that um, uh, hired some like troops, as usual, during, during the Hundred Years' War, and we saw how few uh, you know, knights uh, and uh, heavy troops in general were necessary compared to the uh, to the missile, right? They were just probably in the longbow group like the most um, numerous, the ones that you had to bring on the field uh, in large quantities to be relevant in the first place. That admittedly was the case of England. So it's not always the same in the sense that you may have even l large amounts of troops that are not just large because they are not they're extremely cheap, but tendentially they're going that direction. I mean, you've seen how even the javeliners were more expensive than a longbowman, right, in in the integer. Right? That means something, and people are not prone to recognize, say, the javeliner as a heroic figure that you want to imitate those in values and, you know, historical ambition. Like, there is something in the bow that admittedly is traditional, has some, you know, concept that connects us even to, I don't know if you know about Arjuna, and uh, the you know the entire like mythology of the hero like and the the relation with the bow think about Ulysses and the the uh, the trial that he had to undergo in his own house like to to prove that he was the hero like the bow is important in fact the Odyssey is much more sort of um, Eastern influence than the Iliad is much more brutally uh, Indo-European um, but even in that you know that the guy with the bow actually kills a lot of people um, and. In spite of the fact that the overwhelming majority of bowmen were peasants, um, we, we don't have to forget that the, and this is even more meaningful, every single nobleman uh, ever existed in the age of, you know, pre-firearms, etc., um, was a bowman because he went hunting. And not just that, he was a horse archer specifically because that's where he hunted from, right? So that every single one of the heavy knights that fought against um, the Saracens, the Mongols, the uh, the Ottomans, was a horse archer, and he deliberately preferred to fight as a heavy cavalryman for the most obvious reason that a cavalryman's charge 
was most brutally affected than several hundreds of arrows shot um, against the same, right? And that's what divided. Again, in the you look at the Romano-Germanic laws of recruitment. They're also, but they're also pretty much the same. This is the this this was true in the ancient world. It was true among say the Romans, the Celts. It is true in the later Middle Ages when you know professionalism sort of has kicked in and the population is growing more demilitarized. But whenever like there is properly a um, a, a levy, like troops are recruited from the, the traditional um, levy, like they they are. The segmentation is the same. It's based on wealth, on power, um, and it pretty gets down to the fact that if you are a bowman, uh, especially on foot, like in the West, we mostly would um, remain, uh, uh, you would, you suck, right? And it, it's terrifying. Whereas if you were the, the heavily clad, like heavy cavalryman, you were the coolest thing ever. And this was true, by the way, everywhere. Right. Also in the steppes, as we've seen, the nomadic peoples are mostly horse archers, but altogether they are not decisive, as instead the um, ultra numerical and qualitative elite that their heavy cavalry constitutes. And that explains also what I was saying before, that in the West, uh, say that collectively, like, af after all, infantry, yes, was more important than it was like in the East. And you don't need to make it, you know dominating cavalry, crushing cavalry from some sort of classistic um, sense of inferiority and sort of historical fantasy uh, in your dreams to to make the place where you come from uh, culturally cool, right? Um, and on the contrary, you should focus much more on the reality that the entire system revolved around the night, right? And not just in Europe, as we just uh, said. So, the bow, to make the long story short, was an inferior weapon for subjected people, right? This is demonstrated, for example, among the other things. Here, yeah, I'm just notionistically throwing um, in these uh, these anecdotes. It's demonstrated by a, a passage of a chronicler of the First Crusade that presents to us the poor pilgrims that, as you know, were mostly, like, the crusade was an armed pilgrimage, it's the best definition you can give it, but mostly this constituted, uh, separate them from a sort of following, and also pretty mixed one, of the, probably of, of the military, right, of the, of the knights and their retinues, armed only with a bow. And this, again, is completely normal, because if you read the aforementioned Romano-Germanic laws of recruitment, you realize that this is true for the Slavs, this is true for the Byzantines, um, not just the lowest uh, class is, so the poorest is to be equipped with a bow and to go to uh, at war as an archer, but just the bow is required, right? Nothing else, right? It's not that they are... Um, expected to put up a fight with some other weapon, right? Some sources specify just, I give you, just you have to bring the quiver, right? Which doesn't even say the bow. And maybe at that point, these guys were also provided um, with the bow by, say, a lord, right? Never underestimate how, in fact, organic society really was and how these weren't people living, you know, in separated places and fighting, um, you know, as different classes living in different places. They were part of organically of the same system, in the same art of war, right? Um, the, the the bow was really for them the only type of uh, weapon that they could afford, right? And perhaps uh, in the eleventh century, still actually knowing how to create it, uh, to build it with their with their own hands, which pretty normal, right? If you come from some sort of a migration era background, you realize that. That's basically normal for them. This is not to say that the bow was not important either, right? These masses of archers had played some relevant role. Like you always see it also in the Indo-European mythologies, in the histories really of all these people. There is always like the 
sort of the force of evil, as we'll see now better, that I'll bite weaker and more stupid and less capable uh, and whatever can still cause this nasty uh, damage, inflict this n nasty um, wound and, and even being able to kill uh, the hero of the situation. Uh, you have to wa watch out for the world because simply, like, e even if you major in a, a battlefield in this circumstance, like, uh, yes, you will, you cannot be focused on all the arrows and javelins that are crossing the air, right? Which is something you should always be majoring, as actually the hand to hand fighting was pretty, pretty uh, short in, in the entirety of, of the engagement chronologically, right? So, um, these were individually less important forces, but all together they were causing victims, right? And they helped, like mostly again as an auxiliary role, the hero, right? Uh, by doing what wearing out a bit also the opponent that is also the hero on the other side. So you have to watch out. These weapons, if they had been useless, they would have not existed. Also consider one aspect of this that. Of course, um, bows are different um, in, you know, in, in performance, depending on the size uh, and, of course, the skill of the user. But this is for saying that, notoriously, in Western Europe, bows have always been made in the same identical, without any trace of any minimal difference, in the same identical way ever, right throughout the entire prehistory and history right it's always the same kind of bow it never changes it's always the same right and uh, in the same way depending on the size of the person the true is for the long bow that is to say a completely unspecific type of bow except for the fact it is bigger than the other and that for the rest is utterly identical to any kind of bow that has ever existed and used by any single person in the continent ever ever right um the composite bow has another story that comes as you know from the steps and mounted um combat so horse archery um and we will not see it because we will talk about it um in in other videos and just we'll see it compared to, but this is extremely important for making you understand how Primitive, simple, elementary, you know, un, un, you know, uh, unsurprising, really, unimpressive. The bow really is, right? The long bow, and the fact that the English sort of um, uh, cultivated this in their armies by royal will. Always remember that. It's not that the English victories are due to commoners that were increasing their. England has actually, like the English peasantry, has a substantially worse than other countries in Western Europe. Um, the, the, I made a video about the 12th, 13th century English peasant autonomy, if you're interested in the topic. This wall system is uh, genial, right? It's fostered, as you know, by the minds of Edward I, like perfection by his grandson, Edward III, and it's a royal invention, right? And it has nothing to do with the weapon in itself. It has to do with the fact that it was available in Britain um, it was a bit slightly more primitive than especially from the places where the the this this the soldiers these archers were drawn from so say you know the wood uh, the woodlands um, the the Celtic French right the uh, spoiler we will repeat it now the Welsh have absolutely nothing to do with the invention of that tactics um, and it's the king that decides at a certain point that the English uh, have to practice with a bow during their festivals and the best men and the ones say the, that could be uh, say sent to war would have to be well trained with a bow and so generally speaking given these were you know sort of young tough people um, they were chosen like, in fact being the best being bigger and therefore having a longer bow than the average uh, and for the rest that bow is exactly identical in construction in anything to the others then there is the professionalism of the story that is the, the most important side that is during the 14th century 
especially you start having the with the indentures something ever more specialized and so of course there would be people who had specialized ever more with the use of the bow just like other people in in other parts of europe had done with a crossbow or i will see it now or other weapons and again in in all this the longbow remains always subordinated to the heavy troops uh, and it's just like often used also in very large numbers as we were saying before proportionally to the men at arms so even the the alleged idea that the longbow would have been used in this sense in a specific or particular way compared for example to the crossbows um, considered that there were peoples who literally produced and sold the longbow for and to the English uh, we're talking Lombardy where apparently the um, the the wood used for building it was particularly good because of particular temper of the subalpine uh, forests would keep going on using crossbows right all along right and even when they had the english just in the same place think about john oakwood in italy he worked with a white company etc they would keep going on using crossbowmen right um and again the 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 clamorous successes of the english armies during the hundred years war in my opinion have barely anything to do with the fact that they were using the longbow as opposed to to another bow right a crossbow fundamentally um, so, by the way, the longbow existed everywhere, like we've seen it, uh, covering all the, the historical regions, um, you know, the series about regional warfare, it was used everywhere. Scandinavia had it, um, Italy had it, Germany had it, France, like, all of them, right? There is nothing specific about the longbow, nationally speaking, zero, right, except the particular combination that the English fi find themselves to have, like in terms of their arms ratio, that is, again, not particularly different even from the rest of Europe, actually, uh, and that they sort of decide to keep going on with, right? And we'll keep making, believe me, lots of videos about the longbows, the longbowmen, the battles of the Hundred Years' War to explain this better. Again, the video about Poitiers is extremely clear. It's, it's one of the single most beautiful battles ever, right? It's, it's a real masterpiece of military art. It's extremely instructive. Um, the English win big time, even though they were, um, as it often happens in this in this war, outnumbered, like, like uh, really in a pretty bad situation. Um, and there is no trace whatsoever of anything about this their victory being connected with the longbow, right? And again, I there would be a more theoretical explanation uh, to that overall, um, but I will leave it for for other videos in the first place. But let's go on with say the entire European picture in mind. Uh, we know of peoples. Pretty nice, cute, tender-hearted, fuzzy peoples like the Hans, the Avars, the you know the Saracens, the, the Magyars, all, all people provided with deep sensitivity. You know, you know, at, at a human level, you know, people you could get in touch with. You know, people would be so impressed and tender-hearted by you know, smelling the roses right along the way of their raids, massacring people. You know, uh, in the process, uh, having been very much about um, you know archery. In many ways, I mean, at least they are all peoples that more or less conceived in that way. I mean, except the Saracens, where I have a video incoming about North African and Sicilian, Islamic Sicilian, at least, um, warfare that uh, will show this a bit better. But the others are all steps peoples, right? And so the idea, by the way, of these harassers uh, at the end of the day is that, yes, they create a vogue they are as as we were saying terrible and they they sort of have this anti-civilizational uh, effect in many ways they're fringe peoples at least in the way they are they are met by the europeans um and yet basically they go nowhere either they are crushed or they are they soften up themselves or they are dis destroyed by the same westerners or they transform themselves in the same westerners i may Actually, the, this is respectively exactly what happens to the Hans, the Avars, the Saracens, and the um, and the Magyars. Uh, admittedly, yes, in, in the Crusades, you know what what is called the Saracens. You know, the Saracen is a is a is a synecdoche 
uh, from a classical tribe that lived in the Sinai Peninsula of the Sarkhan Orient. So, so from there, uh, we call the Saracens basically anybody like from the Moors to the, which is yet another of those terms to the to the Turks. Um, and it did, you know, that these peoples would remain with the sort of lighter profile uh, compared to the to the West that had sort of heavier knights, um, be- heavier infantry. Admittedly, less, and this this is actually debatable. Le- less uh, missile potential. Mm, this is something we'll have to see for the Crusades because yes, it is true. Like if you pick a Seljuk. Uh, army, typically speaking, is look, looking very central, central Asian, in spite of the heavily um, persified outlook, right? Of, and of course, they have a lot of archers. But uh, as we were saying before, in the alchemy of the same people within, um, are they so relevant after all? Because they can't really shower the enemy with, you know, even the Mongols with literally millions of arrows in the same engagement. I'm not, I'm not kidding. We've seen how many arrows were optimally brought in a quiver and how many uh, you know uh, horse archers normally were in this army you could shoot up up to you know million and a half arrows in a single major pitch uh, engagement right uh, think about i yeah, look like between the mamluks and the mongols oh you you want to really watch out what falls from the sky there um but are they decisive per se no Right, there is no mention whatsoever in all these engagements of the bowmen winning the battle. Right, um, at best, I think there may be one exception only in a mis- almost meaningless engagement, but I should recheck it, uh, which is a small engagement. And you know that in, by the Clausewitzian theory, that in the small engagements, like the tactical variables can sort of uh, really go crazy. Like if you have a massive pitch battle, more or less you have forces that are very, that, that, like the balance, uh, the odds are very balanced, right? So um, in smaller battles you can have ramble style things, like a guy killing 30 people, this kind of thing. So you may have this random outcomes, and I think, but I'm not sure I should recheck, that during the Hundred Years War there is an obscure battle in which the English were for some reason just Longbowmen, because they had been found, like they had been caught by surprise, um, and they were sort of, you know, detached in that way. But they managed to repel from a from a top hill. The French, I don't know whether they were horsemen, but that may be the, which is likely, I think, that may be the only exception. If you think about con- very contained numbers of of that. I think in the entire history of warfare that I'm personally aware of, I don't think that. We are so documented about like general warfare also for other areas for when arrows were were around on a regular basis to actually find any, any other example of this. In all the rest of the art of war, there is zero of this. Right? You never find the bows making it. Right? It's always the heavies making it. And the and or the combined arms ethic. Again, these are this is the, the key of it. Those guys existed because they were functional for one another. There's no doubt. And they helped. And those who had, like, uh, again, in, in the English tactics, there is no doubt that the longbows played a, a very important role. But again, alone, they would have not made it. Right? Um, so, the Westerners faced, generally speaking, these lighter forces that mostly attacked them off with lighter elements. Like, this is not even just about the Easterner, right? Think about the Celtic fringe, how slings, um, javelins were sort of more of a thing still because of the intrinsic meaning of this all is that, th- that is, if you are reduced to attack the enemy from a distance, not closing in, it means that you do not have the capacities to smash him, right? Strategy is ba- has only one general advice, be very strong. And if you are, because you are the strongest, Punch in the face, because that's the straightest, best way to employ your strategic forces. All strange circumvolutions, unless the enemy is as powerful as you, and so you want to sort of catch him by surprise in that with asymmetry, with flanking attacks that are carried out by smaller forces anyway, you must present always like this, this is a, pr- a core principle of the art of war, classically, like unity, 
right? You have to concentrate your forces to attack frontally in a simple way and smash into the enemy with all the forces you can, because that's the way you have to knock, you, you can't knock him out best, right? Um, so when you look at the Crusades, for example, or in 1238, 1241, when Europe was threatened by the overwhelming tide of this other you know, equestrian horse archer, mostly based numerically, people of the Mongols of Badu Khan that from the Urals, as you know, had uh, overrun the Russian uh, principalities and eventually and they had uh, invested the same Poland, Bohemia, Hungary, right? They had arrived uh, into Germany, they had crossed the Alps into Italy even. Um, and even defeating the famed Teutonic Knights uh, at the Battle of Lenitsa, you know, that was actually a coalition force, but I mean when you look at these and they are, you know, you really have the best, like the, mostly the Poles also, especially the Silesian in the, on that occasion, who were very, very westernized, were very much like the Germans. Um, in that instance, you, you realize that, of course, something did go wrong, right? There was something in the, in the equation of the Mongols arriving. Perhaps the same surprise, the fact that nobody really knew who they, these guys were, um, what the hell that was, like in a world that sees, of course, this um, terrifying sight as a, as a god's punishment for the sins of, uh, you know, of mankind, because these guys are not even seen technically as human beings, or barely. Uh, so, um, you, say, we interiorize a bit as Westerners the idea that we have to be wary of, of the East for some reason, um, and that... Yeah, all these terrible attacks that, however, once you actually look at the thing properly, they did, didn't lead to anything, <laughs> you know, because you didn't know. It's not that the Huns had, I don't know, the cultural capacity of creating or ruling over the Roman Empire or, or the Mongols to conquer Europe. I made a video about this. Um, or, again, the other peoples we mentioned, even less, you know, doing who knows what at the end of the day. And we constantly underestimate, instead, the fact that we, we took that blow, we absorbed it, that's also virtue, that's part of uh, of the story. Um, there, there is, there's some strategic principle and uh, archetype behind that, but it's not just about offense and, and defense, but it's still, you know, it's something at a bigger um, civilizational level uh, that is going on. And these guys are desperate. That what, what we don't understand is that they have it much worse than us, right? When um, the king of France sent... Uh, say received back the uh, the spy uh, slash uh, diplomat sent to to observe like what these Mongols were in Mongolia and China, and the guy came back and told him, you know the secret basically of of the Mongol strength. You know what it is is that their emperor has the stomach to eat something that here in France even the the poorest of your peasants would spit, right? They would never eat. Um, I think that's in a nutshell, like the single best um, explanation, um, besides all the technologistic bullshit that people come up with about oh, the bow, the, the, the mounted archer, the composite, like all this stuff, that's the single most beautiful, logical, cogent, scientific, moral, exp better explanation in general why the Mongols were able to do um, what they did. Right? They were actually a bunch of savages. Like, doesn't matter how orderly their hosts were, how organized, how effective. There is no doubt about their logistics, their organization. But what did make them spring out of that? It's better. I don't qualify it um, to to do what they did. Um, the fact that they were primitives, that they had basically nothing else but that lifestyle, and that. Uh, you know, what what really happened to their empire? You know, do we know of a Mongolian empire that survived? You know, it survived, like, in China, in, in Persia, in essentially other countries that, um, hell, even in, you know, they, of course there were other powers in, in, in Mongolia that remained as sort of the uh, the heirs to, to, to the Kingizid prestige. Like, later on, we have even a, even a Timurid empire, which is another hell of, of empire, whatever, but, I mean, concretely, Right, these guys, as they came, they, they went back. Right, so um, there is even here on the long run, compared to what we were doing, what we were gradually, carefully stratifying in the West, 
and that was already capable of handling these threat like something I think in my opinion much more admirable and in many ways also Peter say irreproachable in the sense that this is typical of the West yes we are sort of in the in our greater advancement we are softer uh, to a degree but we don't realize that we sort of got the alchemy that made the balance right as far as also the toughness of the system right the discipline of it all I was just reading today for a work that I'm writing about um, uh, Dante Alighieri's and, and Thomas Aquinas' view of the concept of, of of civitas, right, and how this overlaps with the imperium. And I want to make actually a video about that because um, the the fact that they got essentially the double thread that existed between virtue and discipline, also from a military point of view, is actually astonishing. I mean, if you look at the aforementioned Teutonic Knights, but we could pick any Western elites there, like, these guys were really the, again, the sum of a, of a massive civilizational capacity. Like, these guys were the peak of professionalism, of, of individual training, and collective training that, in many ways, in the world existed at the time, right? And they were able to fight and die, like, like hell, like, in, in these very battles, like, actually proved to be. And again, if you need to refuse your own center in order to cope with them, because their charge is basically unstoppable from the front, chapeau to you if you manage, again, to envelope them uh, from the flanks, etc. You're a hell of an army. The Mongols were, you know, dramatically advanced. There's no doubt about this. But overall, right, this is just, like, um, it, right? It doesn't go on. It doesn't allow... The Mongols probably, but they probably had never, neither even thought of of carrying that out seriously, like, attempting to invade and conquer um, uh, um, a, a, a continent like Europe. Right. Uh, this is something that you must consider at so many different political and strategic levels. One thing is launching a mega raid. Uh, by the way, not. That it, it, like the invasion of Poland, Bohemia, Hungary, for example, was carried out with a precise route not to come back from the same way because you, these guys raised because of the enormous quantity of their horses, like basically all the grass that that you could find, um, and uh, and so exploring this area, right, and surely crushing these armies and but not staying there, having to come back to the steppe to your own, your own true oil fields in the process. That's a massive sort of military operation. It's uh, incredibly well carried out. The, again, the, the Mongols act brilliantly on the field. They manage to smash the Western armies. But what can they do further than that? Right? Can they really and seriously think just to, to occupy places like Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary? With kind of, with, which kind of resources? Can they think to, to attack, to, to conquer countries like Germany or Italy? Like, good luck with that, right? You know, would you have to stop every few tens of kilometers a massive castle or city to to besiege, like, you know, we're, we're under attack, anybody coming from, from around, good luck with that, right? Um, the differences, again, between Western, Central, Eastern Europe are quite important in all this, and they also often get discarded for political reasons today, right? Because people don't want to actually point out at the actual differences that also existed deeply um, and at the time for being the ones um, of today. Um, and all this warfare had, of course, brought to characterize symbolically the bow further, by the way, because this had, as we were pointed out before, since ancient mythology being the case, loading the, again, the bow with a negative symbolical value, right? This was um, availed, after all, by the same biblical symbology that spoke explicitly of the uh, devil's strails, right? And it was a military concept as well. Again, the the devil fights with strails, doesn't have the courage to attack you frontally. Like he is he's a coward by definition, right? And there is a beautiful uh, depiction of of this uh, of this symbology that you can check out in that video about the uh, Western European knight unit type, like of the, of 
around 1180, right, from the Ortus Delicarum for the, how was it, that Eastern Frankish knight, um, German knight, um, and uh, that is um, this manuscript, Illumination, by Herrade of Landsberg, that um, attributes beautifully, like in the imagery, the angels, chivalric weapons, right? The shield, meaningful enough, also as an anti-missile weapon, not only, of course, um, more of this aspect later. The long uh, sword, the arming sword, uh, that is also a cross, like symbolic, uh, uh, as you know, while the devils and the other, you know, evil uh, guys, including paradoxically Goliath, that is represented with a essentially a longbow, right? Which is sort of weird because you know the story of David's actually killing him with with the with the sling. So this guy is not represented with the usual panoply of the heavier guy like a like a Philistine would have been at the time. Um, in in question, but actually with with a long bow himself, right? And the devils are in fact all equipped in the in the figures with bows and arrows, right? Because those are the bad guys, and they use that kind of weapons. Uh, and not only this is not just about uh, the you know these enemies of of the fate, but it's the same death. And the plague, for example, that are personified um, also in the Apocalypse Nights, right? When you think about the plague of 1347, 1350, that also starts cyclically. It will end just at the beginning um, of the 18th century. Last big one, if I'm not wrong, was Marseille, 1729, one I remember. Um, the when you look at martyrdom scenes, think about Saint uh, Sebastian, right? That is massacred, martyrized, um, with like being shot by by the soldiers with their uh, with their bows. Um, this again, the the same saint in that occasion becomes the par excellence protector of against the strays of the contagion of the same plague, right? And death herself. Is using these strails of, of the plague to kill people. As we were noticing before, even though every nobleman in Western Europe knew how to hunt with a bow, shooting from horseback, and this was absolutely natural for uh, his training, his specifically knightly equipment was not, however, contemplating the use of this weapon, at least in a um, substantial way right again you do find think about how richard uh, lionheart died right it, those kind of contexts that were the sort of the most typical sieging uh besieging a, a mod like you know shooting with the you know trying to to suppress the the enemy on, on the battle man for launching the attack it was a, a very um strict um sort of uh, arms interact com, com, co cooperation as we were pointing out before in the circumstances but uh, at an individual level yes you could have in the nightly um, panoply even a, a crossbow as a side weapon this is not very much publicized but it was a thing right uh, but in general um, the nightly training revolves around the thickly packed shock uh, cavalry charge uh, and the, again, cohesion of uh, its formation that is not considering using the bow in that moment, right? In other parts of Europe we've seen recently, for example, in the Kivan Rus, like there is not like that uniformly um, solid... Uh, feudal military um, uh, class, right, uh, that as, as in Western Europe, but the local men-at-arms is more individualistic in its sense, it still does something that was rare even to find in Sackett's times, that is to say, going at war with, with that shock capacity, the, the Kivans imported lots of Western weapons, 
uh, from the very Frankish world. By the way, they, they were mostly about that model, but they also went at war with the bow. And they would use it also because they faced enemies that were sort of more, you know, um, in fact, stepish in the um, in, uh, outlook. And they uh, necessitated also that, like, lo more, more regularly that long range attack capacity. In the West, you have the. Um, there was also a problem there, for example, the, the lack of strong mass levies right, mass by naval times, because um, the Eastern European interland was a bit more detached from the great trade centers where the princes of the Rus had sort of installed their their power. So yes, there was a strong and well-armed militia, but it was not so eager to go always like there in great, like, larger numbers. In the West, you have uh, a much more structured, like, and heavy profile like, and uh, also very tight control of the elite on society to the point that again the latter functionalizes also militarily speaking to support the knight and so in western battles as you know the missile weapons were always important and increasing at uh, least so in the first like in the high middle ages right um, there is however this notion that the knightly uh, armor especially uh, would be developing and wagoning um, in um, uh, like in the during the centuries because of the crossbow right there is this phraseology that goes around it says uh, why this logic this this sort of concept that knightly armor like for all the blows that they had to take normally against one another, smashing into each other at um, practically 90 kilometers per hour, summing the speed of both knights cl clashing against each other, having to do with I don't know, you know, spears, true can openers on on the battlefield, like heavy infantry, etc. The only reason for which the knightly panoply would sort of become heavier was the crossbow, right? The crossbow is being designed like. And, and even about this, there is not actually an evidence of sort to, to substantiate this. I mean, sh sure, like um, a quarrel or a rhyming in your face is that the reason why um, you would like to be better protected in battle, but that could happen to you even just with the lengths of a heavy guy smashing at your face. Um, so the availability of more resources for example, just in itself, in the danger of, of war, in itself, would automatically bring to a waning of the armor. Um, and the same goes for, um, like, the general needs, again, of defense. Why the crossbow, right? Why is it generally thought that the crossbow had the specific, like, smashing cover? Because if you look at, I don't know, again, any other kind of weapon, they had the capacity of damaging you in the same identical way. Actually, when you look at the development of armor, historically, you realize that basically everything, until the Renaissance, were literally the, the jowls of, of a Harkabuse projectile, like, by far escalates, sur surpassed by scale, dramatically, any energy that was contained by, by uh, you know, that the elastic um, force like a, of, of the boat render armor obsolete for most of the combatants stress that it is true that the 15th century was the moment of greatest armoredness on the battlefield and yes in the 16th you have this mass so there is also an increase in the mass of, of men as we were saying before with the square and so with the lighter equipment the collective training rendering like the necessity of like a single guy to just to be all hyper queer as sort of uh unfeasible right for and counterproductive given that you could obtain more results with this more drilled mass of troops for which many more resources were invested. It was not a cheaper, smarter, but it was just like a heavier, but surely mass a smarter, but like more costly uh, way of war, actually. But cavalry does maintain armor. This goes on for you know, a good uh, century and a half. Um, there are lots of... Um, you know, just continuities, even in infantry armor and whatever. But in the previous centuries, um, look at the evolution of armor, you realize that 
essentially like whatever was thrown at armor in line of theory until plate armor came around essentially swords were designed to be ever more cutting in performance and ideally like a sword was meant to say cut not like powder but say in fact destroying itself by destroying the armor in the process right technology was always at that edge level right a, a double-handed axe could smash into the armor and mostly killing you like without entering but just b because of an internal hemorrhage the same was like the concept of a sling right even against armor um the a crossbow bolt a longbow bolt um would at large be parried by the armor and even at short range so it was it is fair to say that aside from all the dangers that occurred first of all um cavalry speed and uh like the general unknown and the accidents including splinters and yes like some of these projectiles entering armor in, in a way or another because when you're thrown hundreds of them literally at you that that kind of most possibly unlikely shot that you wouldn't be able to replicate uh, even if you tried forever, like, would happen, right, with a certain frequency. But overall, right, it was neglectable because armor was effective, was built, was structured, conceived to stop these blows. So, yes, the crossbow is in that, but it's in that together with the swords, with, with lances, with the axes, with everything it would arrive at you. And so there is no, you know, no explanation why the crossbow specifically would be so such such an issue because it is true that crossbows were were very performing and a crossbow bolt could even of course transpass a person um on multiple ones without armor um but the um let's say the the chances that a that a shot would hit you like at the right angle and with all the energy unspent etc actually was pretty low uh, or at least it could be considered as equivalent to again the, the chance of you being hit by by an enemy lags right during the charge or you know being hit by by a sword during the melee so again uh, why the missile right if that had been the case this this armies altogether would have used only missile they would have simply jumped to an equivalent of you know 18th century linear tactics uh, all equipped with bows and just killing each other like that this by the same composition of animal armies is evenly not there and as we've seen actually the, the the missile elements was the cheapest right the weakest of the entire army so again this notion that the crossbow changed like, the entire panel it's deep technological it's all a pile of garbage like there is no evidence of it whatsoever right um so as we know and i made already a video specifically dedicated by a bit um, still introductively to the english longbow the english tactics uh, connected with that again there was nothing revolutionary about it cross out that um and that terminology when you speak about technicalities um there is just uh, there is no evidence whatsoever that the welsh by the way had anything to do with this except the fact that since they were poorer and they had been conquered by the english recently they uh they could be found at a cheap price like in the in the english armies we have actual register for third i explained this in the 13th century um uh, english infantry video that uh and in, as well in, in others the, the aforementioned ones that actually we see that the english archers were paid better than the welsh ones that surely may have meant something we know that the welsh at some point during an english invasion of ireland massacred the irish that were however all sort of naked um so uh, that's a good a good place like a good way to employ them in that case but again the english ones would have done even like we don't, there is no proof at least that the welsh were any better or worse than the english archers and we're talking about britain so what kind of differences there may have there been in, in the 13th and the 14th century like nobody really knows um it's all a myth it's based on a misrepresent work a mystic misrepresentation of something that geraldus cambrensis said um about the welsh and the, but it, it it doesn't find any 
any evidence whatsoever. Plus the crossbow and were paid more. Consider that uh, too. And the English had crossbowmen uh, as well. Um, the, uh, the English monarchs, as we were saying before, are responsible for the affirmation of that particular uh, estate of the so-called yeomen or freeholders, right, that are particularly useful in a monarchy when you can sort of, uh, by arming them, counter a bit the nobility. Again, England, as you know, has at this point a problem with the barons that have managed to significantly reduce uh, the otherwise very um, uh, very high prerogatives that the, the English monarchy had enjoyed in the first generations um, of, um, I would say, not the English monarchy, you understand, the Norman, the Angevin monarchy, uh, had enjoyed um, in the first generations after the conquest. And as I was saying before, in England, you don't even have much of a great peasantry, peasantry autonomy, right? And the the English lords managed to maintain actually a very also strong local control, right? The England will not develop in a very much more stratified way like uh, to, to France that was also a much bigger system. And so at some point, an imbalance of the same, including the outcome of the aforementioned Poitiers, the capture of, of the same French king could bring to things like the Jacquerie. The English have their revolts, but they're sort of like during the, four, the, the 14th century, um, but they they are not like threatening to literally at, at any point to overthrow the constituted order, and of course they fail as all the 14th, 15th century peasant uh, revolts that uh, bring open paved the way to the, the the full affirmation of the ancien regime. And again, the English aristocracy has a very strong grip on these uh, on on the peasants as a well. rule. But there is no doubt that the yeomen, the freeholders, are uh, they remain afloat, right? They made a video recently about the the, the, the medieval peasantry, pointing out a bit, you know, earlier than uh, for later than this time. But yes, there were free peasants, right? Free subjects without any feudal intermediary. And so again, the crown that had them under her own jurisdiction. So it's not even that they were completely, in fact, free in that sense. There was always the crown in between. Would arm them. As their own, and um, you know, this um, confers them a great pride that they maintain that the the entire also English narrative, say against the tyrannic power of the monarchy, etc., will sort of celebrate nationally at some point, like in British historiography and so on, so that you have all different, say, sort of about Robin Hood or like that. That's actually a medieval legion, but I mean, the weight was, say, declined in a, in a, in an identitary sense, like it's sort of a hint to the, to the freeholder out there that wants to, that fights the oppressive government because doesn't want to pay taxes, right? That's, that's actually not much of a good recipe for, um, eventually functional armies, right? That at some point the state has to take over and to, to make to to show how how the how it's done, um, but and this is actually beautifully showed by the same English history when the, the Parliament starts spending like ten times more than anything that the ship money of the poor Charles the First would have entailed, and Britain becomes uh, a world empire, right? Just for also the same United States history and and, and so on, um, but that's another story. Um, we'll see later how. Even in the Renaissance, surely the Yeomen were were a thing. They were celebrating, at that point, however, an ever more anachronistic type of weapon with which they associated themselves. It was, in fact, the longbow that they had been told to to train with, um, etc. So that at the beginning of the English Civil War, there was still, as you know, someone that was proposing the king to arm troops with a good old longbow, right? Well, of course, the times had passed, right, since... Elizabethan times, like that was just ridiculous. Um, but it was not that, say, the first Tudor era still saw a functional use of the longbow. That was, in fact, the thing. Um, and there is no doubt that this weapon was provided with a great penetration force. 
uh, it had a pretty long range. Uh, again, I will not digress on the performances and also experimental archaeology that I find despicable to some extent. Um, uh, also, the, the notion that the, the rate of fire was higher, so it had to beat the crossbow is yet another BS, right? It doesn't matter how much the, strain, the guys were, were trained. Again, their role was not decisive. The way longbowmen operated... Um, it's not proven to have been any better or worse than the crossbow at any level. Uh, starting from range, uh, even if the rate of fire had been a thing, like we do not get this from, say, as an advantage, we don't get this from the sources. right? The sources actually show us that very often the crossbowmen are in very unfavorable situation, con conditions and pay for that, not because, you know, they were incompetent idiots that went to the death um, uh, without knowing what, what a longbow could do, right? So, again, the rest of Europe keeps using crossbows. There is someone that starts using, I don't know, the Burgundians at some point have a lot of English longbowmen themselves, but it's like together with other uh, bowmen as well. Um, there were all important reasons why the longbow developed in the English army. There was the, um, uh, for example, the the episode of Falkirk in 1298 when the English managed to, actually, they were obliged to 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 soften up adequately the the Scottish skeletons, uh, the this you know quite bulky um, units of it's more like a formation as you know the, the skeletons and such, but. Uh, a pretty generic one, uh, after all. Um, you're talking about pikemen, right? So heavy infantry. I made a bit of for them, actually, for the 14th century, like the military unit type, and um, another one recently about the early modern Scottish pikemen, but more as a as an arm, because uh, as you know, the Scots will maintain sort of a pretty substantial amount of infantry because they didn't have too much surplus for strong heavy cavalry compared to, to the English at least. And so the idea is that the English habituate themselves to uh, hire these uh, bowmen in large quantities, first of all because again they were available, right? They were fighting against a poor enemy in the Celtic fringe um, and it turned out again that these missile troops were pretty good for softening up the aforementioned uh, heavy infantry of the Scots. It was quite numerous, and they mostly met with the English, like in defensive. So, before charging with heavy cavalry into the pikes, which was normal, right? Because the pike is the only weapon that stops cavalry, but you need to have pretty damn good pikemen or strongly motivated, cohesive ones just to stop a cavalry charge, and uh, infantry had used bikes since ever, and this didn't mean that they could stop cavalry, which is the case for the century and half before, like the, the 14th century, when cavalry was fully hegemonic on the western battlefields. So this is not so relevant. They also, the fact that they, the English learned to dismount against the Scots, yet this, it's it is part, partially true. Like the, the reason, um, because the, the the terrain could be difficult. Because uh, still, again, the men at arms was confident taking on um, a commoner um, on on uh, on foot as well. But uh, what you see in the Hundred Years' War is rather the fact that the English were heavily outnumbered by the French in the major battles, and so they um, essentially are cornered because their army is strategically inferior. And so they end up fighting on a ground where they try to maximize defense and in order to um, exalt that, betting on it, as opposed to going to a charge against a numerically overwhelming enemy, they entrench. Um, and so it's better than, than nothing. It, it, it highlights the defense, but it's not that the English man at arm was just conceptually just a an infantryman, uh, as opposed to the French that was a cavalryman, right? The English men at arm was a cavalryman primarily right and so the the reason why they, he would start fighting that way uh it was just contingental to the to the context it's by the way not surprising that next to the 
development um, of, of the bow, like for these specific purposes, the um, centuries between the 12th and the 14th witnessed a remarkable development of a weapon that uh, in turn like uh, could boast like an old tradition, the crossbow. Right, I will not digress in the history of the crossbow. I made some videos, one about the origin of early artillery that sort of has to do with the development of the gastrophatis and so uh, the early crossbows that would never die out uh, throughout the Middle Ages. Actually, in among the picks, you find crossbows like in the full, not even early, but beginning of high Middle Ages. So you, you know that the rest of Europe would have still had something of that kind. Um, then I made a video about the Western Frankish crossbowmen, right, more, more, more or less like the 10th, the 11th century. We'll talk more about the crossbow in the future, but didn't make so much about it after all. Um, at this point, you know, the projectile was known as quarrel or beret. Um, the difference stands in the section. The quarrel is squared uh, and it's better against armor. The beret is conical and it's better against softer targets. It's a matter of, you know, physical um, structure, with molecules of metals, like if you want to pierce um, um, a metal uh, plate, you have um, it better with a pyramidal section like the uh, the quarrels. Um, but there were all kinds of arrowheads, as you know, for different range, different targets, different functions proper so we're not going to digress on this specifically but the um, the idea is that it had also pretty long range um, it depends also on what kind of weapon you're you're looking at because there were of course less performing crossbows like less performing bows in general uh, the fact that the crossbow was much more widespread in general than than the longbow uh, um, Europe wide doesn't mean that like, um, in fact, the, the average crossbow was the one that would have been used in specific tactical circumstances. Sometimes it was a very poor weapon as well, so the peasant militias had them. Um, so it would have not been so performing like the also more advanced types that especially the, the professionals of war that specialized uh, in crossbow use would normally employ also in some of the major battles uh, of the time. But do not underestimate how you know, advanced, uh, the crossbow was also technically in large numbers in many areas of Europe and how performing um, it really was. Um, it had, as we've seen, a lesser rate, but it, it had, for example, uh, a greater penetration precision than the, the bow in, in, in general, right? And there is all a debate. There are some historians who came to the conclusion specifically that the crossbow was more performing. Like, in, in general, it was a better weapon to have than the longbow. I do not like this thing either because it's not about which was best, but what kind of context they were used in and sort of what, what was their collective use. And again, historically, we do not even have any positive evidence that anybody cared about which one was better or worse. Um... And so the, the performance of a unit is something that does not depend on the technology that it's employing um, overwhelmingly. Um, so I don't care. Um, in any case, the crossbow was brutally performing. I mean, it, 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 there is the story that it, it was considered such a deadly weapon that its use would be at some point um, regulated by even... Uh, the ecclesiastical councils that declared the crossbow use illicit against the Christians and allowing it only against the infidels. On some history books you still find the notion that uh, the Lateran Council tried to ban the crossbow, right? That's not true. Like what they were doing was uh, essentially prohibiting the heretical uh, uh, groups that roamed around also as brigands, as mercenaries, as Brabanson, to um, put themselves at the service of, in fact, certain uh, causes that were against the hierarchy, against 
constituted order in general and of course like all crusaders uh, uh like used these weapons but also any other christian would use these weapons it was n nobody really ever thought to sort of think to stop the the spread of the crossbow uh in a practical sense also because again the crossbow had always existed that's the other misconception it's just that in that point in history the feudal uh, and ecclesiastical elite was trying to discipline ever more the the society like the peasantry and so the idea is that these get there couldn't be an indiscriminate spread of weapons in the first place it's such a good an effective one to, like the crossbow but not because the the good guys like the, the chosen guys couldn't use them in the first place um that in fact you know we keep using that and there was no stop uh, whatsoever in the spread and the development uh, of this weapon famous um, crossbowmen of the middle ages were for example the Gascons I talked about the Bidot um, that were actually javeliners just the other day that were mostly from Gascony Navarre uh, and uh, part of the reason is that these were mountaineer peoples that sort of went out abroad fighting and it's not much that they had a preferentially missile warfare in their um, uh, ethnic background. But, I mean, yes, in the sense that they were so poor that, again, there would be missile troops, right? Normally, because these were also relatively, say, they were good troops in terms of cost benefits, but, uh, say, on the market. But they were also sort of ragamuffin troops of, of some sort. Um, some of them would be very well paid. But the most famous ones were notoriously the Genoese, right? Um, Genoa, as you know, would um, specialize in this craft for no real, real particular reason. I mean, um, the the notion is first of all that the crossbow had a massive development in naval warfare within naval warfare and so the Italians would have mastered this uh, to an important extent. There is no doubt that Italy had together with France essentially the and parts of Spain like the, the most advanced military technology available and they would maintain like especially by the 13th to 14th century they were surely um, the first together with the French. But um, like the Terrestrial communes used the crossbow in the same way, right? Um, Genoa had two factors that sort of seemed more um, more important. First of all, the fact that it was an isolated city. Like, there, there is the mountains in the background uh, and the sea in the front. Um, it has a lot of financial means and it's expanding in, in the west and around. They get hired, as you know, by the Genoese, by, uh, excuse me, by the French, and they um, uh, essentially become like some, uh, not just as crossbowmen, but also as sailors, as marines, uh, as admirals, whatever. So they know how to sell themselves professionally, and they have also very good control on the St. Genoese troops, a bit like the Swiss later, that they would attempt to maintain their pike square craft just into Switzerland. Instead, they start selling their, their services abroad more freely as individual units. Well, the Genoese uh, maintain a tight grip on these soldiers. They foster them. There is a general tendency in the West to have um, few a few elite um, missile troops in, in your army. This is also the case during the Hundred Years' War. Like, the Longbowmen were apparently more, like, they were more numerous than the Genoese used by the French, right? And and this was true also in the Italian armies that uh, had actually pretty good crossbowmen, but and a consistent part of them was sort of elite. There were some of the few commonal units that were sort of professionally paid uh, during the 12th to 13th century before the, the era of the condotta and the and sort of the world professionalization of this. And and some of these troops remain, as we were explaining also in other videos, next to the men at arms where the rest of infantry collapses sort of in the fourteenth century, uh with the plague and the crisis um of European infantry, etc. 
Um, so that's the reason. It's not if you pick like the peasants were good crossbowmen, but you find some certain, I don't know, Umbr crossbowmen are pretty good. There are, you know, crossbowmen for from other places are good. Like it's not just about Genoa specific. And there is actually a lot to research still because some of this is notionism, right? There is no doubt that these were among the best, but the level of specialization of the crossbow men, especially in places like Italy, etc., it's it's sort of, you know, very high. Uh, also down the than the true, right? And so this should be understood not much as a matter of like it, it is in part because of the crossbow men. But it's also like who uses them in, in which specific battle, where do they come from, what do they do? And normally in the sources, really, um, the sense that that city had the best crossbow does not emerge, right? This is mostly like, this thing of the Genoese that again are pretty good, mostly appears because in the Hundred Years' War they make sort of the exotic unit, right? That okay, so these Italians have. Um, the favor of the French king that normally hires them, and so you find them as these outsiders to to France uh, in in the war, and so they they stand out. But if you go to Italy, these guys are like people are not saying, "Oh my God, we have to hire the Genoese," or you know, our crossbowmen are not you know, as good as the one of the other. But more or less, like the quality is sort of the same. It's something you must study. You must look at the sources to to really get in a systemic way. Um, there is no doubt that uh, like crossbow takes over Europe in a, a virtually universal fashion. Again, the the bow had been sort of more prevalent up to the the tenth, eleventh century, right? And after that, you start seeing the crossbow really spreading. And uh, it would be interesting to to know exactly why, like the sense is that the mostly the communal forces were in a sense more technically advanced and or they more than else they uh, were more affluent, they could participate to the army in a more civic sense so they would have weapons that were pretty good, they weren't just like the, the simple peasant bow they were really uh, forced that the knights of the same city required to be armed like that to really harm the enemy harder but this again spreads more or less everywhere uh, nobody also ever thought less of the Genoese after the defeats uh, in the French armies during the Hundred Years War right the French kept using them there is no sense of like there are some accounts you know the famous one with the French right over the Genoese well that's just one account of, of the many of the battle of Corsi and it's not really necessarily just surely a, a Frenchman would have you know a Frenchman at arm would have thought very poorly of, of anybody finding a foot in the first place it's considered disgusting and the scum of the earth um, but um, they did that in a social cultural way not because they didn't know how capable or necessary they were in combat so uh, Say there are also other feelings in, in a battle when you see somebody breaking or in or when you can't move uh, like from a certain part of the field, you may ride over them, but it's not really uh, like a factual information that we are sure of 100%. And nor again, there is anything to suggest that the Genoese were sent just in a particularly poor way. Well, in that case, there is the problem like, how were they employed by the French? Um, there may have been a doctrinal issue but nobody really knows right they're just speculations at the end of the day um, and again the Genoese keep being employed so whatever is the, the case that they were an elite force and they were considered as such other aspect that you will know is that the use of mounted archery in the west does not spread as in the east Right, the, the were mounted and uh, say mounted archers and, and crossbowmen, 
but they were just mm, and sometimes they were even an elite unit meaning that uh, just like the crossbowmen as we were saying before like there were some states paying a tiny force of mounted crossbowmen so particularly highly compared to the rest of the commoners and they wanted to have it as a sort of semi-professional force uh, semi-permanent even um, but overwhelmingly archers remain on foot uh, the reason for this is that the polities and the battlefields are so compact that doesn't make any sense to have all that mobility. I mean, if you want to attack somebody from the flank, right, especially given that the western lines are pretty heavy, you, you kind of do it like just with a direct attack, right? You do not need um to subtract particular heavy forces from the main line to cause a flank attack or to carry out a flank attack which is also not really an eastern borrowing that the, the westerns always did it's just at this point it starts getting better documented you do not really need uh, again these non-decisive forces at all like if, if you can field wings of spearmen like you're a winner <laughs> like in many ways those are better than the uh, archers that are still cooperating with them but are not too relevant compared to that uh, heavy force there is um, some um, evolution in the bowman's uh, equipment in a way um, from one side there is a professionalization make the long story short uh, during the mid 14th century crisis as we were saying before the rest of the infantry sort of collapses numerically because the estates that made it up were really hit hard by the by the plague by the, the economic crisis um, and the regimes that remain in charge like the princes the patricians uh, will keep hiring these elite missile troops next to the men-at-arms that remain like well robustly at the center of the equation especially at that point um, there always will like until the pike squares but that at that point were sort of together with the missiles as if they had been the only type of trooper like just gradually in the second half of the 14th century and the first half of, of, of the 15th you have this increased amount of uh, specialization of different troops within the ranks as an organic um, uh, unit and rather than else. Um, these were normally professional mercenary troops, salaried uh, professionals that were thus better equipped, they knew how to, for example, fall on the enemy flanks when uh, they were engaged into like hand-to-hand -to -hand combat if they had taken out the enemy wings in the process as well uh, they're often also armed for sustaining melee even though they are not doing solely really an, as an arm right it's more like a broader economical issue like a 14th century english longbowman normally can buy a sword right? it's not uh, so expensive for an indentured soldier like in the previous centuries uh, this doesn't mean that Longbowman is able to put up a stand against uh, heavy troops. But they can do stuff, right? In other contexts, that is not a pitched battle, and so they, they can be spent in, in different ways. They also get better armed, better protected. Um, this doesn't mean that actually the archer in itself becomes particularly he uh, heavy as, as a type of armored force but uh, otherwise again they would have been something else there are some elite units that are well armored etc think about the Gag, the Koswa or you name it. there are some instances but they're true elite and they're sort of contained and they're still however light troops they, they can kind of last more if they're caught out there in the open which was an issue um, but they they're not so dangerous as um, overall like in the broader ergonomy right actually missile force is stronger in the 
as a wall, like in the in the first half of the 14th century. This is impression I get, but it doesn't mean that I don't know. As in quote, the you know the archers were not important. But overall, the sense of this massive, especially wings uh, on the flanks of the of the heavies of the main battle line uh, ends in the, the first half of the 14th century. And you don't have it anymore in history because after that, like also the Renaissance armies were not actually larger, and later it's just they develop in a different way because they are much deeper. They have much deeper pike squares, so the way also the the missiles is used is slightly different. They are uh, gunsmen, right? So it's a completely different tactical balance in some ways in the relation between the various arms. Also about this, it doesn't seem that the uh, missile weapons had a particular role in the uh, weighting of the man at arms armor. Uh, like they had, together with the wool weapons that were around in these later centuries, by the way, firearms were around, but it's more like the tactical role of the man at arms within the lanks and the general political and social reasons why that type of military organization had developed that makes the thing, like there are some heavy horsemen that become ever heavier, others that are slightly lighter once again. Um, It's really not, um, that mirrors the stratification of society, the the temporary impoverishment, I would say the strengthening of the elite and the capacity to control the other guys. Right, it's a prelude to what we were saying before in terms of, you know, of the development of the Renaissance ar- Renaissance armies in the noble that manages to hire larger masses and controlling them without being scared, sort of. Um, so, again, it is a factor, but not such a huge deal as it's mostly been, been seen in, in many ways. And again, if firearms developed, for example, and even crossbows, for example, uh, or longbows become ever more performing individually, like, why wouldn't armor or any other weapon become? You know, there are certain type of weapons that, you know, by uh, by white steel that appear on the battlefield, or at least develop further, that are also pretty much more smashing-oriented against the same hour, so why should we think that it was just about the crossbow and not the, the gun, by the way, that would have made that huge chance. Again, this mentality mostly stems from the fact that people concentrated legitimately, like because it's a very important chapter of Western warfare with, on the Hundred Years' War, but the Hundred the hundred Years' War is largely just France and England, right? So, yes, there are other you know, it's fought even in Spain, and there are other, you know, nations that interfere. But like the rest of Europe is basically, except the Far East, just all crossbows. And it doesn't seem there that the art of war was changed so radically or significantly or differently, by the way, from the Hundred Years' War. Um, nor you can look at that war and, and thinking that was such a radical change due to arms and armor evolution. We mentioned the big tree of the Hundred Years' War, Crecy, 1346, Poitiers, 1356, Azincourt, 1415. Um, these battles are definitely not random per se. I mean, there is there's a lot of randomness connected with them, but they can be read as a part of a system, right? And there is no doubt that France had was undergoing a military crisis. There are all the reasons why this was going on. Um, it had expanded very fast during the 13th century. The army had not been homogenized. Uh, the organization was sort of very um, unregulated more than heterogeneous, the English instead had been fighting a lot, they had a a smaller, more compact monarchy that had been pioneering this sort of continuous 
warfare that there is an important um, level of control by the monarchy that profits of the dynastic issues of France to interfere uh, for many other reasons um, and to to display this military uh, capacity especially from a tactical point of view that however doesn't take away the fact that throughout most of the war like England is the weaker side of, um, and also strategically speaking and that ultimately they lose so these battles may have been very important and the French defeats against the English are part of a structural trend but you can't quite say that cavalry um, was defeated by this war. The French keep using cavalry, and it's uh, the finest one in Europe but up for a very long time, actually. Um, they also have issues later with that, but it's not that they weren't winning battles for that matter. For example, the Flemish. Um, here we're not talking, okay, the Flemish did not have a significant missile arm, right? If not artillery, but it's also quite embryonal in they lose anyway, but against whom they lose? Against French Burgundian armies. The usual cavalry, Crecy's, oh my god, the Flemish butcher, the flower of the French cavalry. Uh, Monopaval is a so so victory, and then all the single battles that the Flemish fight against the French, the Burgundians fundamentally, they lose clamorously, heavily, badly. Right, until Guinegat, and just because Maximilian of Augsburg has imported the Swiss contractors to try to make a Swiss reform in Flanders that fails anyway. So what does this tell you? Was was uh, cavalry over? Were say, you know, the Spanish or, or the Italians or the Germans sort of dumped that were continuing to use heavy cavalry for their warfare? It was ineffective, like they, they had infantry that sucked, by the way. Uh, what's the point? Right? It, none of this is sort of like an answer and nor it's a thing proper nobody also has ever properly studied this thing that's that's the problem nobody has studied like medieval warfare in a compared way people either fixated just on context like the hundred years war and thought that this was europe um and western europe and the rest did not exist uh, or pick just like the largest battles so oh my god you know the, yes these defeats of the French plus Varna and Nicopolis. So there must have been something wrong. It surely was something wrong. By the way, I should point out that the English armies of Edward III were, and let's say of his successors, the, like in terms of symmetry, like in conditions of material homogeneity, like France and England were the same country under that profile. Um, they were, given the repeated victories in strict military inferiority um, the, stro the strongest armies in history like there has never been any other army who performed like that under these conditions then there were uh, stronger armies in, his in history in other sense and in other ways and for other records right but the English ones in this condition of symmetry and given the, the numerical inferiority they were the strongest once in the history of mankind. This is not a matter of personal opinion, it's not my wishful thinking, it's mathematics, right? And what we know about the numbers of history. So, evidently, like, there is, um, you know, a point here, but, for example, not just historically, but philosophically, where do you differentiate here the English say, capacity from, say, the French incapacity. Like, to which point were both sides competent or incompetent? Um, these are three battles. But let's say, like, if you look at each of them, like, the English were in a pretty dire situation all the time. So yes, and managed to pull it off. But what were the, the chances, the, what was the likelihood Right, because in all of three, actually, was the French represented the might, right? And so again, especially as in court changes everything. Uh, in a also in a, a, a sound strategic level, but overall, 
like you can argue that things may have easily also gone in another way so the odds again were quite balanced after all and we shouldn't think that there was instead no okay the french sacked crossed out they sacked there was a problem in the entire system in the entire western european model that fundamentally was the same of the french and of the english themselves actually and um it's so not just the english because of these wars and there must have been something unique and so special and they were different and nobody can compare no right they were incredibly similar armies uh which actually increases the english value in this sense because again if they are the more they are similar it, it, so in, in those conditions of symmetry like you're actually better because you're not exploiting some sort of intrinsic inferiority of the enemy again the french armies were pretty darn good they weren't crumbling to pieces before the battle all right so yes there was something wrong with them at some level but it's not like very different from all the issues that armies normally have when they fight wars because again i can't think of, a, of an example in history of an army in which everything was going well like in terms of command of discipline of organic of supplies of you know intelligence re reconnaissance of you know general you know the, the previous update of the army militarily socially like there are always lots of issues right armies are always sort of at the at the extreme of their uh, to their capacity that's especially in these longer take bigger engagements like always like the case the odds are balanced right otherwise you don't fight that's quite simple um and the, the the battle is the resolutive moment that's the only moment that can shift um, the say the strength uh, of strategically like in in a significant way but before that like there is that quite balance on so it's not fair to say at all that the proud french cavalry was humiliated by the english archers right it's not correct right if, when you speak of the english archers they did not do that because the french had their own archers from their side archer i, I say archer for not saying crossbowmen all the time but you know what i mean they're bowmen let's put it this way um they were if anything emulated by their own counterparts right and again also the combination men at arms bowmen is not unique they both the french and the english were using them in the same battles all right also the fact that the english men-at-arms dismounted in those battles was actually not a proof of some you know military wisdom matured against the the scots um uh, that uh, were actually an inferior enemy to the english as well that you could say the same thing for 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 the wars of Scottish independence. You can't say that the English had a worse army than the Scots. Right? War is as a matter of moral forces. You had to see where and how these and why these guys fight, right? And England was a greater power than Scotland and was reflected also in at a tactical level. But they the, the English lost. Right? So uh the say they they lost the wars uh, too in that case. Uh it, but I mean tactically speaking just like the French did in this major engagement of the Hundred Years War but again they won the, the war right but you cannot say that the English men-at-arms dismounting at Crecy, Poitiers, uh, Azincourt were actually uh, doing so by saying we are winning because we are dismounting because the issue there was that they were already in a condition of strategic inferiority for which they were obliged to, to dismount to attempt like the to concentrate everything on the defensive that by strategic declaration is the is a uh, fact of self-evident inferiority these were all knights right they were all cavalrymen um so again all wrong in the general impression that at least i have matured a very firm like opinion on the topic through my medieval warfare studies and i the more i go on the, the less i see how 
like I see why people did uh, think uh, otherwise, but the less I see how it can still be defendable when you actually study the, the thing um, in with the proper strategical coordinates, right? We're talking about the uh, the bows that, as we've seen, were not technically superior specifically in their specific employment the size in, in this context. Uh, there were lots of other factors, um, the same tactics, how they were organized, the synergy between the various arms. Um, in part, there were prejudices. In part, there were... Um, you know, um, you know the the even the leveling factors that we don't tend not to see because they're not equivalent. There is the um, again, it's useless even to attribute to things like the stakes on the on the ground, the trenches, the ditches, or this stuff. This, this is again anybody who does that precludes. Say he's telling I'm in fear because I have to dig in. Right? Doesn't mean that I won't win. Actually I do it because I hope to win, but not because my situation is temporarily better than one of who has the capacity to offend. Right. Uh, and this is like we've seen it in the phone crease here, it's like the entire deal in the in the first place. We see also lighter troops that at this point come around they are for example the um, the Catalans the Hungarians uh, there are some other troops that sort of uh, fight in um, in that lighter fashion because they need to complement the cavalry is becoming ever heavier so you have actually a wide range together also with introduction of firearms of missile troops. Exactly from the east, however, other novelties arrived. Right? The Ottoman expansionism um, can be interpreted in part as the um, collapse of some of the weaker areas of Europe right? that had sort of spent themselves or had undergone less civilizational development historically um, and or that they had been suffering severely of the 14th century crisis, they were more exposed to the world of the steppe, of the Turco-Mongolian um, onslaught, right, and uh, give way, right, the populations properly accept Ottoman rule, which allows the Turks to enter, uh, like, the Balkans, they uh, finally seize Constantinople, um, while in 1453 indeed the West had not helped Constantinople that much, um, when you look at the, the expeditions of Nicopolis in 1396 and Varna in 1444, you realize actually that the West had put up a, sort of a massive resistance. Uh, at least these were pretty solid um, expeditions sent. They could have crushed the Ottomans. Like had they lost one of these battles, right? They they would have been wiped out. Uh, the West always had the chance of doing this, also later on, um, even after Constantinople, at Belgrade, um, the, you know, there was a chance to march on Constantinople. There were other times in history in which this was feasible. The Ottomans, we made lots of videos about their warfare, there are others actually incoming. Ottoman tactics are practically good at everything except at uh, stopping infantry. Right, uh, they have hardly like, um, like the um, heaviness right of the properly of the estates that the West is developing even after, and especially after the crisis. I mean, in a more robust fashion, in the Renaissance, the Ottomans do not have pike and short warfare essentially. Uh, they have the Janissaries that are equipped with bow, with scimitar and dagger. These behave well in battles like Nicopolis and Varna, but one cannot say that uh, this type of infantry as such was anything, first of all, innovative, nor actually uh, very competitive with the same Western infantry that would be gradually be developed in the 
you know, in the 15th century, in the 16th. Um, by Nicopolis and Varna, as I was pointing out in general, like uh, you see that the European armies are composed by chiefly, like as the size of arm cavalry. So also, this is a pretty powerful indicator of what I was saying before regarding the fact that infantry hadn't been supplanting cavalry in Western armies. Um, not even after the first half of the 14th century, uh, infantry-only victories on cavalry. This was not the, the time yet, nor there was actually a, a reason to abandon that model in those years, considering European politics and society. So that's the victories at Nicopolis and Varna are a bit similar to the ones of the Mongols of a um, couple of centuries before, in as much as they envelope the Western charge, uh, they have oh, some lines in depth of, of defense. So actually conclaiming the fact that the Westerners are stronger in the charge, right? This is what the Byzantines thought during the Crusades, what the Arabs thought at the same time. I have a video, by the way, in coming on uh, the Battle of Durakin in some time, right? So 1081, so that that's yet another good example of what we're discussing in terms of the Western superiority in the shock force. Um, chapeau to the Ottomans, just like to the, to the Mongols in these battles. They managed to maintain controlled coordination, they managed to envelope the enemy. Uh, and again, these are interesting battles that we will analyze hopefully in depth soon. Uh, it depends on the cycle and what comes out. Uh, of uh, like, like we are covering like in detail um, medieval warfare. In fact, there aren't just these battles, right? Um, the Ottomans made a lot of archery use, but this again doesn't invalidate what we're we were pointing out for the broader dynamics of the art of war before, right? Um, these are composite bows, and yes, composite bows have been there for quite a long time. The same Romans used composite bows in some of their ethnic sort of auxiliary forces, right? Uh, the composite bow can be found, as we've seen in Eastern Europe at some point, also in Southern Europe, especially in the early, in the High Middle Ages. So and that's really a stranger, and again, as we've seen uh, with all those steps peoples, or even the Saracens, like, it's not a game changer, actually. The Westerners have the upper hand. So it's rather the command, the, the tactics, the, the moral force of peoples like the Mongols or the, or the Ottomans that really makes the difference in a concrete sense and contingently because again the West did not collapse but they did at some point I don't want to even digress on topics like how because I already discussed them how the Westerners first of all so the Mongols for example or the Turks and how the Mongols start hiring Western crossbowmen at a certain point, uh, up to Persia in the Middle Ages, or how the Ottomans get always this pretty uh, heavy load of Western uh, technicians, instructors, uh, etc. at their service. Right? Think about Orban's guns, just to, to make an example, just to see that it's as if these peoples had in part themselves dwelt within a broader Western civilization. I've seen how this was so impacting, even in the Western steppes, arms and armor, how like the West was pouring out an enormous amount of of uh, hardware that like it, it's not something you to learn on history books. The um the story is, oh my god, look, the Middle Ages were so dark and bad, the plague, the, this terrible invaders from the steppes, ooh, it's so gloomy, we were so under, morally, uh, it's terrible. No, we were just expanding like crazy. Um, so, you see how much the mind can play tricks on you if you let them do? If you let others manipulating you for that matter. It's even basic history, like... I'm, I'm not giving you some exoteric knowledge. I'm simply making some points, of hopefully with sense, and 
you know, does it seem like the like the, the catastrophistic picture that we have normally been presented with? Uh, by the way, today I quoted just like a bit of battles, uh, but there are lots of others being fought, which lots of interesting things happen that sometimes you've not been really told in their say well, how does it look when we know all these other things in the picture and you don't focus just on certain specific topical questions in all this the westerners have been affirming their own also technological quality bows crossbows guns are particularly well affirmed right uh, there are Western colonies, say in Crimea, on the dawn, uh, there are like uh, like all these industries exports, like true um, true market, like su supported by an incredibly sophisticated and effective financial banking system, right? That still from Europe dominates the Mediterranean, that's yet another thing until the Ottomans, that is often not even properly represented. We see a lot of naval warfare as well, and a lot of resources invested in that as well. The world changes. Um, today I don't know exactly how to finish this video because eventually there is all an evolution, but if we were to separate like the, the Middle Ages from the Renaissance, you realize how, for example, still in the 16th century the English had not yet abandoned their longbows. That, as we've seen in part, were just also a symbol of liberty or even of nationhood. Um, except the Tudor takeover, that's like a very ancient regime a system. The English, after the defeat of the Hundred Years' War, uh, basically enclose themselves within their island and they remain sort of behind uh, compared to continental development. It's not until Cromwell's new model army that England will have from let's say the mid-16th century a truly updated force. Um, in Again the early Tudor era as we were saying before was actually you know, the English had a good army, a good navy. The longbows were there. And they were not anachronistic yet, right? They knew, still knew how to fight. Again, the English had to import a lot of stuff. Armor, guns, mercenaries, including heavies, um, as heavy infantrymen, um, for remaining updated, right? They, the English, like, do not have their own uh, equivalents of the Landsknecht, right, for example that they import rather as the German mercenaries were prominent in England. Um, we will talk more about this stuff. So uh, it, it's really the mid-16th century that witnesses the, let's say, the decline of weapons like the crossbow, the longbow, even the composite bow. This is the moment in which um, Timofievich uh, conquers Siberia, for example, like the, the pike-and-shot tactics of the Westerners um, break, for example, the peoples of the steppes. So this monstrous peoples of oh, with the bow, whatever, you know. The westerners get pike and shot and they overwhelm them. Pretty quickly, by the way. In fact, the Ottomans, too, are so formidable from a military point of view, frankly, not because they are yet the other sort of squalid um, Central Asian tribe nesting somewhere in the Middle East. They are essentially Westerners. I mean, they're raised on the Marmara Sea uh, from the same within the same Roman territory, and they uh, have a hell of a infantry and artillery compared to the, say, the Safavids or the Mamluks. They still live in the Middle Ages until they get severely beaten uh, by by the Ottomans themselves. Um, so, no, like you can't say that you can't say that say the Ottomans had good horse archers. They use had a lot of Tartars from the very steppes. Um, but also they didn't have such a good heavy cavalry in a compact, structured way like the Westerners. 
The Westerners thought that the Sipais were actually better individual horsemen because they did come from that sort of still medieval individualistic uh, ethos and background, but they weren't as framed within a modern state um, in the in the way Europe was was becoming. Again, the the Janissaries do not develop that same resistance that the pike and shot formations of the Westerners really have. Right, so they have other virtues. They dominate in artillery, for example, in artillery technology as well. The granulation of the powder is theirs, right? So, which means that until the introduction of the bayonet, that they essentially have the upper hand in terms of uh, artillery quality, or in or at least they match the the Western one for until very late in time. Um, they also have, in fact, the horse archers that the uh, Westerners do not quite have. They're more mobile, but they lack that punching element in a tactical sense, even though, let's say, in a tactical theory, like not much because they aren't punching as armies. But again, that can happen even if you're, for example, a huge army. We will, I have a video about the size of Ottoman armies that I've been preparing and by the way, again, for all the fans of people who think, oh my god, the you know, the, 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 the infantries of the Middle Ages, they were really opening the path to modernity, you know, it's our freedom, it's our civic liberties, it's, it's us, you know, it's the, the little people, it's the commoners. Just know that uh, the longbow is not disappearing just in parallel with the spread of firearms, but in Elizabethan times there is a redistribution of the land that privileges the great uh, private property to the disadvantage of the small land owners um, and also the say the usages of the the civic usages let's say of the peasant and pastoral communities in England and at that point longbow sort of fades because these guys are technically and just social anachronistic in in the in the way the political military system was organizing itself, right? So the myth of the rise of infantry, my eyes, right? Um, and especially in parallel with say during the Renaissance, for sure, in a in terms of the arm, but absolutely not in terms of individual liberty or whatever. And it's it's shocking how there are uh, literal adult people who still believe this. That's the thing blows my mind more than else. I mean, literally, this is the ABC of your national history. Like, if you do not know this, what the hell have you studied in school? Don't you know what the Ancien Regime is? Don't you know what the Tudor era was? You know, what actually happened socially and politically at the time? Uh, but again, there is a myth that must tell you that there is the progressistic, positivistic uh, rise to the stars that wasn't happening again because especially also in this case of England things were actually slowing down compared to, to the continent where even that was accompanied by a strengthening of the elite and yes the, the spread of infantry forces in large masses that were all hired controlled and ruled by the elite <laughs> no you know that there was much more of a chance for for a nobleman to be cut to, to be killed by a peasant in the middle ages than at this point in history but again, you know, everybody wants to, um, again, invent their own, say, pleaser or whatever. Um, so, a bit all over Europe, you have the same thing. Like, bows and crossbows survived in the sport, in hunting, in those festival competitions, uh, which... You know, the, the libertates of once upon a time, like, were still sort of cherished in memory because they did not exist anymore. Um, there would be so much to say about this whole thing. Um, but, let's say, when I make these videos, because they don't happen too frequently, right, about this very topics here, but I hope that people leave with a sense of, like, okay, this is clear because it makes sense. You know, it's not just somebody's opinion. It's just like, you know, this has been studied. There's a scholarship on it. It's not a fringe theory. It's what you would call mainstream, if I didn't hate the term. Um, it's 
like what you should know if you have like sort of basic education in a first world country why don't people know this or they seem to ignore it or they don't insist on it when they make their own political spiritual cultural considerations like um we all know what the political debate fundamentally is today um even as a right winger like you know how equally depressing both the right and the left ideology revolves around here like they're all the expression of the same like on average like of the same squalor history is the key for everything right this is people seem not to have understood i know that my, the prevalence of my audience is anglo-american and there is this empiricistic attitude to moral values that is to say if something works good do it all right this is the Fordian, the uh, you know, the, all what also made. And I, as you know, I I don't have actually a very very positive bias towards, say, Anglo American culture in general. Uh, of course, what you see today is a moment of crisis and a moment of big problems. But this is not because the stock was not that good, but there is a, a severe flowing to that, and that it is the lack of a doctrinal background to traditional knowledge, right? Things do not work because they are successful on the market, per se, but there is something that makes them successful on the market. And if you don't teach people that doctrine, that theory, that you can't study only true history, not simply even opening the Bible and pretending that you have the capacity to read the Bible by say yourself that that's an unfortunate case because you know that there is this democratistic attitude oh no the bible is everything that's also a very protestant thought for that matter um there is a context into this how many prominent political commentarists go out there and say okay now we have to refoster say the sense of christianity on which basis if you do not know even history if you don't study ecclesiology, if you don't study theology, if you do not have the paleest idea of what the pillars of the Western civilizations have been in a chronological order, on an actual historical basis, not what you have sort of gathered on the internet randomly from an unstructured, unsystematic study of the same. I'm talking what we teach in universities. Um, do you know what that is? Do you know that there are books? Do you know that there are, like, that there is an historiography that there are actual texts and that, again, you should have a humanistic education uh, to be elite, right? Because if you're not elite, you cannot be a traditionalist. Um, we're going in the opposite direction from both sides. Like just there, there is one side that goes it more, say, goes it fast towards that faster and others that are going slower, but still pretending that their personal subjective human standards can be compared to God into the history of mankind in relation to God. You know, you can be free. Just think the use of the word freedom. Freedom applies only to God as a as a as a as a status, as a condition. People cannot be free by definition. At best you can have liberty. How many people understand the difference between freedom and liberty? And why we use them? Have you ever studied theology? Have you ever actually studied the Summa Theologica? Or have you ever studied the, mon the monarchy? If you do not even know what I'm talking about, you cannot afford to be a Westerner equally when it comes to military history, which is essentially the mirroring of, of this spiritual history. Like, if you do not know the fundamentals, what are your chances to understand anything about today's world? Everybody is suddenly an expert about the, the war in Ukraine, right? Everybody has sorted that out, right? Because, you know, they're deeply, you know, they have this higher deep strategic education, you know, deep analysis, deep understanding based on what? Playing total war games? Um, you know, um, it's difficult but for this reason beautiful and so 
I'm excited by it actually to teach military history in this time in history um, um, and it's however also like you can feel the burden you can feel the like how like how hard uh, it is really to to do it relentlessly because you understand that hardly any of this is absorbed and so it's it, it, it's dramatic it's tragic but at the same time, it's what, 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 what we have really. So what we learn from it is actually the most fundamental notion that only cowards surrender, always. We will surely come back on these topics. There's so much to say that never ends. And legitimately, these videos are... Like people think that I'm making just very short introductions on my channel and in a sense it is true but it's come on it's not so much like you know that I get pretty much into the depths of every single aspect like, especially in medieval warfare like if we're talking about modern warfare contemporary war it's different right but ancient medieval aside from the difference in distribution uh, content wise like we are getting pretty thoroughly into it and even if it is still superficial in a sense like you have no idea how much there is um so it's this is youtube you can't make everything um and you can't make everything well right but comparatively speaking of subjective human standards like at least for youtube standards it seems to me that this helps a little bit in absolute terms as well which is what matters right so I would say that um, this is uh, all I, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.